You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com forward slash brain. Make sure to use the promo code BRAIN at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Are you annoyed by affirmations? Are you tired of that same old rehashed personal growth advice that all seems to boil down to think positively and all your problems will go away? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then I want you to get ready. The Overwhelmed Brain is here to help you create the life you want now. Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain. I am your host and personal empowerment coach, Paul Coliani. I am here to help you increase your emotional intelligence, strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem, and empower you so that you can make decisions that are right for you. All the questions I receive on this show are from listeners like you, and all my replies to those questions are my personal opinion and are meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right, let's uh, start the show. I've got an email that I'm going to read right out of the gate, and uh, let's see if we can get through it. It kind of uh, goes in different directions, but um, I'm here to keep it together, <laughs> keep us focused, and address the main issues that are going on. So let me read it, and we'll just see where we go with it. Uh, this is from someone I'm going to call Billy. We'll use a generic, non-gender specific name. Billy says, I got married in my late 20s to a man I've known since childhood. We dated briefly, then got married. So yeah, the dating went quick. We love each other. We have lost several people in our lives. One of those people is my best friend. She had a heart attack. I'm getting along okay, but there are times when I need her, like when I'm hurt and I feel unloved. I'm not sure how to take care of a marriage that needs taking care of without my voice of reason. Um, so um, before I read the rest of this email, I want to address this first because Billy doesn't really get into this part later on, so I'm just going to address this right now where, because this is one part of many aspects of this email, uh, where she's asking, I believe Billy is a she, that uh, what do I do without this voice of reason? What happens when your mentor, your best friend, the, the, your teacher is no longer there? And I'm going to give you some off the wall well, maybe it's not off the wall to some of you, but it's off the wall because it's going to sound impractical. But I want you to play with it because I believe it can be very effective for reasons I'll share with you in a moment. But here's what I want you to do in, in regards to when you lose someone who has been your mentor, your friend, someone who has been wise in your life. Just ask yourself the question, what would they say? You've heard that before, right? Like, what would Paul say? <laughs> or what would my friend Joe say? What would my friend Molly say? What would my teacher Mr. Smith say? What would so-and-so say? And then really sit with that and see what they'd say. Now, this works, I would say, most of the time. I, I've done this myself. You know, What would a future me say? There's another angle. What would my future self say if he came back and said, all right, you've got this dilemma. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Oh, that's, that's good to know. Tell me. Yes, I want to know. The trick is trusting it. Because it's really all inside you, isn't it? I mean, when you're asking yourself, what would so-and-so say? The answer is coming from inside you. But, you know, this is, like I said, a little out there. You know the answer to deep down level. It's just that sometimes you're afraid to take that advice. You're afraid to trust it. And I'm here to say that most of the time it's correct. I won't say all the time because sometimes it's going to lead you down a road and it turned out to be the wrong decision or it was the right decision that led you down a path that was uh, not fun, uh, made you feel bad. But then you pick yourself up and you learn a new lesson. This is like I talk about when people have trouble trusting their own decisions. I say make the decision whether you believe you're right or wrong. Just make it. You know, take a step forward into it so that you're not in stagnation. When you're in stagnation and you're not making decisions, you're getting nothing done. I would rather have you get something done, even if it was the wrong decision. That way you can learn from it and move forward. Because a lot of people, they will sit on things and not move at all. 
and never get anything done because they're afraid of making the wrong decision. And I'm here to say that when you make a decision, even at the risk of being wrong, at least you're moving forward. At least you're going in a direction. That way, uh, if it turns out to be, quote, the wrong decision, then you can pick yourself up and you've learned and now you can move forward. But you never learn unless you do. I mean, this is common sense stuff, I know, but the way I'm approaching it is a little different where you go, all right, what would this wise person that I once had in my life say to me? Or if they're still in your life and you just can't reach them for some reason, then what would this person say to me that I trust that always guides me in the right direction? And then believe it. Believe what comes up and just go with it. Now, if it comes to a life or death decision and you're worried that, oh, maybe there's a possibility that I could be wrong here, then maybe it's a good idea to find someone else. Maybe it's a good idea to find someone who is more adept at answering questions that come up for you that are more severe, more important, have more of an impact in your life. But for most questions that come to you on a daily basis and, you know, in your own mind, ask yourself, what would so-and-so say? So for the first part of this, Billy, that's what I'm asking you to do. If you don't have that best friend anymore, then just think about your best friend. What would that person say? Now, some people are going to hear this and go, that's just, that's dumb advice. Don't say that. That's not true at all. And all I'm telling you is regardless of whether you believe that will work or not, this is for those people who have trouble making any decision. This is for those people who can't figure out their next steps and don't know how to progress and don't have anyone that they trust enough to ask those questions to. I'm not saying that everyone should do this. I personally feel that you should, <laughs> but I'm not going to espouse my personal beliefs onto you. That's my personal belief, that when you do this, you gain more wisdom. Again, even if you're wrong, you still gain more wisdom. This is uh, what we were talking about uh, on a previous episode between Matthew and I. We were talking about how did you gain wisdom? How did I gain wisdom? We talked about that. And this is one of those ways we just try things. We do things. We keep moving forward. We tend to get in a rut when we make no movement at all. And then we wonder why our life isn't working out. Why isn't anything happening in our life? Because we're waiting for other things to happen or we're, um, we're afraid to take the next step forward just in case we're wrong. Be okay with being wrong. Because what will happen is the more it happens, the less it will happen. The more you make decisions, the less wrong you'll be. Because you'll find out what's wrong and what's right. So there's my off-the-wall, kind of out-of-the-practical-realm uh, line of thinking. Although, again, my personal belief is it is very practical and it is very handy to have this resource inside you. Because I do believe deep down we have knowledge that we can't always access, very subconscious, uh, and uh, I can prove this because my girlfriend will wake up with an entire song in her head, but when she's awake and conscious and she tries to think of that same song it's not there i mean this is what happens right we wake up thinking about something we understand something we have an answer for something and then 10 minutes later when we get up and make breakfast or take a shower we try to think of what that was and we go oh, it slipped my mind where did it go and we try consciously to access our unconscious mind and we can't access it because it's just buried down there a lot of answers down there so this is what my girlfriend does she'll wake up with a song and no matter how tired she is no matter how groggy she feels she will run to her keyboard and start writing and record it on her phone just so she can keep that song and uh doing that i mean that's how when we went to that music event uh, a week and a half ago uh she got an award for a song she woke up with with a video that she had in her mind while she was asleep. This wasn't something that she was even really thinking about. She just woke up with it. There's a lot down there. And I want you to know that you have access to those resources. And sometimes you have to trust that those resources are there. If he were here or if she were here, what would they tell me? My girlfriend did this in therapy once. She went to a therapist while she was still married. And um, she couldn't figure out how to get through this relationship there were a lot of things going on very emotionally abusive and she wasn't sure how to handle it and the therapist asked her if i were in your shoes 
and you were in mine, what would you tell me? And immediately the answer came out of her mouth. She goes, run. And she didn't realize the impact of that statement uh, until a few months later when uh, she finally made that decision to get out of the relationship. But she knew the answer. A lot of the times we already know the answer. We just don't believe that it's true. So Billy or anyone listening to this who just can't seem to make decisions, who just can't seem to trust themselves, to trust their instincts, to trust what they know, just use this little exercise to help you through it. It doesn't mean you'll always come up with every single perfect answer, but you may be surprised what you do come up with. I mean, I've come up with some certain things where I said, what? Why would I say that? (laughs) If future Paul came back and had to guide you through this, what would he say? And then something would come up and I'd be like, why would I say that? That's not right. That doesn't make any sense. Yet, if I follow through with it, things usually turn out better. Let's put it this way. I've never had something turn out awful. Like I said, okay, what would so-and-so say? And then I do it. I've never had something like turn into something so bad that I no longer exist. I'm still here. It's still working. Things are still going on. This is what I want you to feel too. So anyway, Billy, that's the first part of your message. Let's get into the second part of your message, which is, at a family member's wedding, my socially anxious husband seemed to be having a good time, maybe drinking too much. Well, I figured it's a wedding. People drink. I don't like getting drunk, but I'll drink a little when in situations like this. Well, all of a sudden, I see him getting his jacket and heading toward the door. I run over to ask him, what's the matter? He said, I'm leaving. I asked why. He gave me that, you should know why, glare. So I thought he meant that he was getting anxiety again. I told him, I was under the impression that you were having fun. At this point, I had to grab all my stuff and practically chase him down the sidewalk halfway up the block. He never gave me an answer. I asked him, are you sick? Same glare. I said, okay, I'm confused. He said, you should go back in. I told him, I'd rather be with you. He asked why. He acted as if I were ignoring him inside. But that wasn't true at all. We were both enjoying ourselves, and I thought nothing of it. At this point, I'm dumbfounded. I don't know, maybe it had something to do with the three drinks he had. I didn't keep track. It could have been more. But now here he is, yelling at me, telling me how we could have nothing in common, telling me he only loves me because I'm the mom of our child. He even told me that I am the least sexual person he has ever met. That's crazy, because only a few months after we got married, he didn't want it anymore, and he rejected me every time I tried. I'm not a needed-all-the-time person, but more often than hardly ever would be nice. But I adapted and changed to suit him so he could get what he wanted. But I'm not even sure he knows what he wants. He changes his mind like the wind. I let him make the moves because every time I try, he comes up with a reason he doesn't want to do it. So I don't press the matter. He also says being married to me is like being married to a tomboy. He says that I don't communicate well and he misunderstands me. So now I find myself explaining what I mean when I talk to him. But I'm so afraid to offend him. But I don't consider myself a mean person. I don't know, maybe it's in my head. But I do have major depressive disorder, and he has PTSD and other anxiety and depression-related things, but he doesn't stay in therapy long. At least not long enough to get anything from it. I don't want him to feel stuck in this relationship, and I only want him to be happy. I'm asking myself, why does he hold on to something if it makes him so unhappy? And he said, it's not me, it's in his head. I'm not sure if you meant it's not him or if it's not you, Billy, but I'm going to assume that uh, he's saying that it's not you, Billy, it's in his head. He creates exaggerated scenarios and thinks that's what's really going on, things like that. But we never specifically talk about it, except he said he isn't interested in sex anymore with anyone. I did ask him in as gentle a way as possible if he'd like to be a different gender because I could see anger coming from frustration like that. He said, no, he just doesn't want sex because it's awkward and primitive. All right, I gave you a lot in this message. I want our relationship to work. He says he does too, but I'm not sure he really does. And that was it. Thank you, Billy. Thank you for sharing all of that. And uh, it would seem like there's a lot going on in your relationship, but I'm going to look at this as uh, an analogy I use sometimes, which is filtering through a funnel where you have one issue, which is at the small end of the funnel, and that issue is the filter. And everything that happens in your relationship goes through that filter. 
So you have this funnel with a filter on top. It's sort of like a coffee filter, right? As you pour water through the coffee filter, the water turns into coffee flavored water. It's, now it becomes coffee. Same thing with um, relationship issues. If there's something major going on, uh, usually the rest of the relationship is affected and goes through the filter of that major thing. So the question is, what is the major thing? Well, from the way you explain this, everything you're talking about probably, I'm guessing here, but probably is going through a filter in his mind of something that is either happening to him now or happened to him in the past. Now, if something happened to him in the past, because there is a sexual nature to, to your comments here, uh, it is possible that something, you know, some sort of sexual abuse occurred in his past, and that is now affecting him today, and he doesn't want to bring it up. It's embarrassing. You know, when uh, if he was a child, a lot of children feel ashamed. They feel, you know, unnecessarily guilty because they were put in a position where they were told to keep a secret or they loved the person they were with and that person, you know, betrayed that love and abused them. All kinds of things can happen to a child that grows up after being sexually abused and have something going on today that was a direct correlation with that uh, childhood abuse. So if there was some sort of sexual abuse when he was a child, it is possible that is manifesting today and that's why he doesn't want sex. Now, that's one possibility. I'm not saying that could be or should be. It's just a possibility. Because if that's true, imagine that being the filter of the funnel. Everything filters through that. His whole life filtering through that past event. So nothing can ever be as happy as he wants it to be. Nothing can ever be as trusting as he wants to be. Your relationship can never grow into what it can grow into until he heals from that. If that's the case, that's a, that's a tough one. That, that requires therapy. That requires healing. And there are several ways to do that. I've had a, a couple episodes on that, and you know, there's more people out there that talk about this, and there's therapists that specialize in, in this. So if that's the case, uh, you know, that would be a great thing for him to pursue. But what happens, uh, especially probably in men, is that they don't want to pursue healing from uh, sexual abuse or child sexual abuse because then it reveals that they were abused. And some men, they can't handle that label. They feel like that's a label. Like, I was sexually abused. That must mean I'm, you know, su such and such. Maybe they think that people will think they're gay and they don't want that. Or they think that uh, they're less of a man because they were violated. I mean, there's all kinds of labels that men might put on themselves so they won't feel the embarrassment, the shame, the humility, you know, whatever they feel because of it. So they refuse to seek help. And that's a mistake. That's on, I'm telling you right now, that's a mistake. You know, step into that. Step into all those feelings and address it. Otherwise, you carry it with you. And everything gets filtered through that. And life is never as fulfilling as it could be. Men and women, anyone that's been through that. You want to step into that healing. But let's just say uh, that it wasn't sexual abuse for him. Let's just say it was either another abuse or trauma or even like a bad relationship. He could have had a bad relationship that really soured the milk for him. And now he's looking for perfection in this relationship. Who knows? Whatever it is going on in his life is something major, but it's going on in him. Like uh, he said, it's not you, it's in my head. That's probably a very smart thing to say. If that's what he said, if it's not you, it's in my head then that's great because that shows a sense of responsibility. That shows that, yes, I know something is going on. I need to get it. I need to heal from this. I need to talk to someone about this. I need to fix it or whatever. But the next step for him is to actually fix it or at least, you know, try to address it, try to heal it. It doesn't, I don't necessarily mean fix it because he's not really broken. I just mean step into it, explore it, do some introspection, some reflection, figure out what's going on in there. And he may be doing this already. But he might need some help. And if he's not staying in therapy long enough, my thought is either A, he's talking to the wrong therapist, or B, he's talking to the right therapist. And it scares him because he's getting closer to the truth that he doesn't want to reveal or he doesn't want to believe is true. And if that's the case, you know, that's that precipice of pain I talk about. The closer you get to the truth, 
the more pain, the more um, the more emotional hurt you feel inside, and you just don't want to climb the mountain to that peak of pain. You don't want to reach the precipice because then it'll hurt more than ever. But once you hit the peak, it's all downhill from there. I mean, at least it gets easier. Once you hit on the most painful aspect, then you get through it. You can start healing from it. The downhill is the healing part. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying after you get past the precipice, after you get beyond that threshold that you believe you, you can't handle, you will handle it. You're not going to die even though it feels like it. You're going to just reach this peak of emotional pain. It's going to feel awful and then you'll get past it. But the idea is to get up to it and address it and process it and start healing. That's a way you can start healing from it. Now, along the same lines, if he has this major thing in his life that he hasn't addressed yet, that he hasn't healed from yet, then what people typically do is they start finding fault in everything else in their life, in other people, so that they don't have to address it in themselves. It's a lot easier for me to point the finger at you than to point the finger back at me and go, wait, it's not your, for example, your addiction that's causing the problem. It's me staying in a relationship with an addict that's causing the problem because I keep getting mad at you. I mean, that's a, an extreme example, but it's a true example. I was with an addict. She had emotional eating issues. And I kept judging her and judging her and being upset. And it caused a lot of problems in our relationship. Well, after we separated, I realized, wait, I'm pointing the finger at the wrong person. All this time, I'm pointing the finger at the wrong person. When I pointed the finger at myself and asked myself, since it's my responsibility for my own peace of mind, for my own happiness, what do I need to do for me? And those questions started coming up instead of pointing the finger, telling her she needs to change for us. This might be going on in him. He might have something going on inside of him that he wants you to conform to his way of being so that he doesn't have to address his own pain. And if he's in that state where he doesn't want to address his own pain, then everything you do will be wrong, even when you conform perfectly. I mean, that's almost the recipe for an emotionally abusive relationship. I hear this all the time from the people who've purchased my mean workbook, from people in both the mean uh, Facebook group and the overwhelmed brain empowerment group. People talk about their relationships with someone where they're getting criticized, they're getting judged, they're getting blamed, they're getting faulted for all these things that really aren't their fault at all. I mean, they're part of the issue. They have a responsibility in it. But I mean, there are specific things that they had nothing to do with, yet the finger is pointed at them constantly. And it's because the person doing it, the person pointing the finger, doesn't want to believe or deal with what's going on in themselves. It's a lot easier for the world to conform to me than for me to have to conform to the world. That way I don't have to address my own pain and my own healing that I need to do. I mean, wouldn't that be great if we could all do that? You know, I've got this problem that I can't handle, and whenever you do this, it triggers me, and it makes me feel angry or upset. So what I need you to do is don't do the thing that triggers me, and then we'll be happy. And the problem is a lot of people do that. Okay, I'll stop doing the thing that triggers you. I'll build resentment towards you because you don't want me to do that thing anymore, and you don't want to get healing yourself, but I'll stay in the relationship because I don't want to trigger you. And that is what helps keep a relationship dysfunctional is that we do have people that conform to the way we want them to be so that we don't get triggered. And I don't want you to be in that space. I, I want you to be in a space where you can be yourself, assuming that you do your best to be ethical, moral, supportive, nurturing, uh, kind to your partner. You be yourself. You do what you want to do. You have your own issues, of course, and sometimes they will trigger your partner. But um, if you're with someone who needs to control every aspect of you so that they don't get triggered, then you're in a space that uh, really is no win. There's no win out of that. You can't win if you're always conforming and they're always molding. It just doesn't work. There's too much taking and not enough receiving. There's no balance. So I want you to think of that too, Billy, is that if you're in that type of relationship where he's always trying to mold you and you're always trying to conform and adapt, it's not going to work. It can't work that way because there's no balance. And when there's no balance, there's always resentment. 
that builds on one side. And in your case, you're probably feeling a little crazy, like there's a little crazy making going on where you're trying everything you can. You're doing everything he needs you to do and wants you to do, but it's still not good enough. So you start pulling your hair out because you don't know what else to do. That's because he's continuing to avoid what he doesn't want to face in himself and put it all on you. And that's a never-ending, non-winning battle. Now let's talk about uh, your final point, which was sex. So my personal experience with that is when sex stops, the relationship is on its way out. I hate to say this because, you know, there are people that can get along great when there's less or no sex in the relationship. But again, this is my personal experience. When the sex stops, the relationship is on the way out. It's usually because there's less of an emotional connection. Sure, you can have raw, physical, primal sex and everything can work out great if that's what you're into. But uh, in a deeply connected, emotionally connected relationship, at least starting off that way, when the sex stops, it's usually because the emotional connection is being severed. Now, with that said, uh, you did mention that sex feels awkward to him, or you said something like that. When it stops, there's something deeper going on. There's something else. Look, when my first girlfriend stopped desiring it from us, it wasn't because of something she was going through. It wasn't like um, a problem she was having. She just started falling out of love with me. And after two years without sex, I was young. It took me a while to figure this out. <laughs> I realized that, oh, she no longer loves me. I mean, she, she finally told me this, but uh, that's what happened is that when the sex stopped, it was a clear sign that something was wrong in the relationship. Something was off. It wasn't the same relationship anymore. It wasn't even a relationship anymore. We were just going through the motions. When you go through the motions, if there's nothing else holding you together, then it's going to feel dry. It's going to feel empty. You're not going to feel very loved. You're not going to feel very lovable. You're not going to feel very important to the other person. All these feelings will start to kick in because the emotional connection has severed or it is severing or dissolving. And because of that, the, the sex has slowed down and is withering away. In a, quote, normal, healthy relationship, sex would be one of those things that is shared and enjoyed and also very desired. But if there are parts of the relationship that aren't working, then that's when sex isn't so desired anymore. And I would say when it comes to sex, uh, Billy, with your husband, him telling you he doesn't want it tells me that whatever's going on in him, he's refusing to address it. You know, some men are afraid to share truths with the closest people in their lives. They're afraid to be that vulnerable. And so if he never comes to that space inside of him where he's truly vulnerable and can't feel safe enough with you to share exactly what's going on, you're not going to get too far. Because I, I tell you what, this is my guess. If I were to ask my future self, okay, what should I tell Billy? He's going to say, look, he's got something he doesn't want to tell her because he's afraid of how she'll react. And he's afraid of what that might mean. So he's not going to tell her. And because he's afraid to tell her, he's all pent up inside. He, he might be triggered. He might be emotionally triggered. And if he tells her, he thinks she might leave him. And that makes him afraid. And he doesn't want to be left behind. And he doesn't want to hurt her feelings. But he feels like he needs to tell her something, but he knows he won't be able to because it will hurt her so badly that he will look like the bad guy or she'll leave him and he will feel he is being abandoned or rejected. And there's some dilemma going on in him why he won't tell her. Because I really believe that when somebody uses what I see to be an excuse, like sex is awkward and primitive, I see that as an excuse. I really believe that somebody uses that kind of excuse to avoid telling you what's really true. And who knows what that is? It could be anything. But I would have a serious heart-to-heart -heart with him and just tell him, our bodies desire sex, so what's preventing you from wanting it? It's not about awkwardness. Now, it could be. I mean, it could be awkward because of some sort of sexual abuse. And if that's the case, then that's the thing he doesn't want to bring up. That's the thing he doesn't want to talk about. That's the thing he needs to address. So, Billy, the big issue is inside him, it sounds like. It sounds like there's something he just doesn't want to address. And until he does, your relationship can never be what it is. I mean, this is for anyone listening. If there's something going on that's big 
in your life and you're just too afraid to bring it up. It's going to affect your relationship and your relationship will most likely go downhill. Your relationship will most likely suffer for it. So I am all for getting the big stuff out. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you believe that if if I tell this to my spouse, they're going to hate me. They're going to leave me. They're going to yell at me. They're going to be triggered, whatever. But you either spend your entire lifetime with them filtering your experiences through that big thing. You know, everything you do in your life, everything you share has a trickling of this big thing that's on your mind, that gray cloud that covers, that follows you around. Or you get rid of it by expressing it and finally getting it out in the open and taking the risk. I know it can be a big risk. If you have something really secret and it could be really damaging to the relationship, it could end the relationship. Or worse, it could lead to lawsuit, it could lead to divorce, it could lead to a lot of stuff. So there is a big decision there sometimes. I personally hate holding on to big things because then I can't enjoy life. I would rather just take the risk so that I can start enjoying life even though there will be that precipice of pain. There will be where I have to reach a threshold of something I don't want to face. I know it's going to be painful, but I do it anyway because I want to have more clarity. I want to feel this weight off my shoulders. And I hope he can come to this place, Billy. I don't really have too much advice for you personally, except that when you're with someone who has this cloud that he's walking around with and everything is filtering through it, it's going to be very difficult for you to ever show up in a way that makes him happy. And especially if you're conforming for him, you'll never be happy. If you are never showing up as yourself and you're always trying to make someone else happy, you'll never be happy. It just doesn't work. There's too much give and not enough receive. So, Billy, I hope this helps you understand where you are in the situation and that if he is unable to address these things in him and come to a place of healing in him, then you're always going to be the recipient and the target of everything that's going wrong in the relationship. Not the most positive outlook, I realize, but at least there's a realization that maybe you can use to help you take the steps you need to take for you. Thanks for writing, Billy, and uh, thanks for enduring my uh, congestion here. I'm kind of stuffed up because of allergies, and uh, I have one piece of advice for anyone with allergies. Don't move to Georgia. (laughs) I've never had allergies before until I moved to Georgia. Now I'm in Georgia, and suddenly I have allergies. My whole life, I was fine. Don't move to Georgia. Thanks again, Billy. I wish you the best with this, and uh, we'll be right back after this. So my girlfriend and I have become uh, Casper snobs, and I say that because we spent some time in a hotel room, like three or four days, when we went to this music festival thingy where she received an award for her music video, which is awesome. <laughs> it was it was awesome. Uh, but we went to bed the first night in this uh, rather nice hotel, and when we laid down, the first thing we noticed, I mean, this is why we're snobs, is that... Uh, we test, you know, how our elbows sink and how our butt sinks and how our shoulder sinks into the, the bed. And um, we don't do this actually consciously. It just immediately becomes a point of discussion. So we laid down for the first night and we immediately noticed these sinking points on our body. And we both look at each other and she asked me and she goes, well, what do you think of this mattress? And I was like, um... It's okay. You know, it's fine. It's a nice hotel. They they have nice mattresses and giant pillow tops and things like that. So we slept okay that night and we woke up the next morning and she had the stiffest neck and back and shoulder pain that she's had in a while. And the first thing she says to me is, I miss our Casper. <laughs> and I said, me too. Uh, not that I had the worst night, but she definitely had uh, a very bad night's sleep on that bed and these are nice mattresses nice hotel nice mattresses but um it's just not our casper and so i feel like we're becoming casper snobs you know we've had the casper for about a month now 
and our sleeping has changed tremendously. We are just so grateful at how much time Casper has spent、uh, creating what I like to call、uh, the perfect sleep experience. They combine multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface that has just the right amounts of、uh, both sink and bounce. And that really shows. I mean, like the first time we opened it and the thing just unfolded because it came in like a four foot box. It was really cool. It opened up and just makes this noise as it unfolds. And we think there's just no way it's going to unfold into a king size mattress, but it does. And the first time it did that,、uh, we both laid on it and we enjoyed it immediately, of course. And since then, it's one of those things where I don't know how to describe it. Like when you sit on a very comfortable chair, You don't think about it. It's just comfortable, and there's nothing on your body that hurts. There's, you know, nothing's pointing into your back. the The back is perfect contour. the The height of the chair is the perfect height from the floor to your knees, and everything works perfectly. So you don't say anything about it. You sit in a chair, it works perfect. You don't say anything about it. That's how it feels like when we lay down on our Casper at night. We lay down, we don't think about it because it just conforms perfectly to our bodies. Whereas our old mattress, as soon as I lay down, almost every night. I would comment on it. <laughs> I would say, "Oh, this mattress! I just my butt's sinking in, and I wake up with a backache." I would do that almost every night and wake up every morning unhappy. So that's why I wanted to try this Casper mattress. I knew that we had a hundred night risk free sleep on it trial, and、uh, that's what you get when you purchase a Casper mattress. You get to use it for a hundred nights risk free, and they'll pick it up if you don't like it for any reason. They'll pick it up, and that's it. You get your money back if you're in the U.S. or Canada. They'll ship it to you for free. They'll pick it up for free. They want you to be satisfied. And one thing that really satisfied me was their affordable prices. I think that my opinion is that they are the most affordable, highest quality mattress out there because they cut out the middleman and they sell directly to you, and they do deliver in all ways. With an average of 4.8 stars, Casper is becoming the internet's favorite mattress. And we have become Casper snobs. <laughs> I want you to check them out and also take advantage of the fifty dollars towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com/brain and make sure to use the promo code brain at checkout. That's casper.com/brain using the promo code brain and get fifty dollars towards select mattresses today. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back. I am doing my best to continue this show through my allergic response to the state of Georgia. <laughs> Nothing against Georgia; it's actually gorgeous here. But、uh, boy, it's just stuffy and congested and stuffed up in my sinuses. And I guess I need to take something for this because this is、uh, hard to speak. It's hard to enunciate correctly, and I feel very nasally. So I apologize about that. But let me just read you this quick email. I picked a quick one. We'll see if it has a quick response, but this will be our final email, and then we'll close the show because I don't know how much longer I can、uh, continue to talk on the air here. So let me just read this for you. It is from someone I'm going to call John. John says, "I have a child with special needs. My wife has a lot to do while I'm at work. This has caused our relationship to be near the end. There's also infidelity on both of us. She's still holding on to things that I've done in the past. I have forgiven her for some of hers." But I still don't bring it up like she does. That's it. That's the entirety of the email. I told you it was quick. Thank you, John. Thank you for writing that. And I just want to say this: this sounds like John is in a desperate space. I'm making some assumptions, but something that is written very short like this, without really a question, and because of the subject matter, I believe it's one of those things where someone has reached the end of their rope. They're like, I, I just don't know what to do. You know, my my wife is still angry at this, and、uh, she brings it up. I try not to bring up her past or anything that has gone on that makes me angry. I know she has a rough time. I just don't know what to do. So I'm going to take it like that, John. That you just don't know what to do. You're at the end of your rope, and you're just unclear what to do next. So where I go with、uh, questions like this is ask what the most prevalent problem is first. You know what? When you look at your relationship, what is the most prevalent, impactful issue in the relationship? 
you know, what is the biggest stress point? You know, we could look at the infidelity and say, okay, you cheated, she cheated. So, you know, what does that mean? That means that there's betrayal on both sides. It doesn't make things even, although it sounds like it might. But what happens is each of you now has to deal with the betrayal of the other. Now, I don't know if one of you dealt with the other's betrayal by betraying. That could have happened. And if that's the case, then one of you might feel a little vindicated and the other might not. So there might be something like that. Or one of you found out the other cheated, and so they cheated to get even, but then it made him feel worse. I mean, that happens too. If you find out your partner's cheating, so you cheat on them, then you feel worse because you're breaking your own commitment to your partner. There are all kinds of bad feelings that come around cheating, and a lot of relationships can't survive it. Some can, but a lot can't because of what I call emotional murder. I mean, you're literally murdering the emotions that are in the relationship because what you had can no longer be. If your relationship was based on a certain level of trust and that trust is destroyed, all those emotions were connected to that trust and the betrayal destroys the trust and those emotions were destroyed along with it. They were murdered. The emotions were murdered. I know it's a harsh term, but that's what it can feel like. You murdered me emotionally by cheating on me. That's what it can feel like. So if you've ever cheated on someone, that discovery has a lot of pain. Now, relationships can survive infidelity. They can survive because after this emotional murder, after the betrayal, if both people are willing to give it a shot and the person who cheated actually regrets doing it and realizes how big of a mistake it was and promises and will never do it again, you might be able to build something even stronger than you had before. And that's possible because with the old level of trust and the old feelings and emotions that you had for each other, since they were not fully realized and fully solidified, because if they were, you know, cheating may not have occurred. But typically when you have fully realized emotions and you're fully connected to each other, and you're, you're honest with each other, and there's clear communication between the both of you, then cheating doesn't have to occur. You just talk about it. You talk about things like, hey, you know, I don't enjoy sex like I used to, or I'm not feeling emotionally connected like I used to. You actually talk about this stuff because you have an emotionally available partner that's willing to be vulnerable, that's willing to talk about the hard things, and you get them, get them out on the table and you can talk about this stuff. But when you don't talk about it, then you don't have the type of open relationship and open communication that can sometimes work toward preventing infidelity. Open communication is working toward preventing infidelity. Even the hardest communication there is. Like, I hate that you're gaining weight, or I hate that you're losing weight, or I hate that the clothes you wear, or I hate that you're losing hair, or you're growing your hair. No matter what, all or any of these things can be hurtful to your partner. So we typically don't say them. Then we hold these this anger inside of us. And the anger is typically, we want them to change, but we don't want to say anything about them changing. And they're not changing, so we give subtle hints and we're passive aggressive. And we hope they figure out those hints and they change, but they don't. So I'm going to go cheat. And that's what happens. We hold all these thoughts in and we don't share these thoughts. And it leads to things like infidelity or emotional infidelity even, where someone's texting or messaging or emailing or calling someone else on the phone and they're sharing things and feeling their emotional needs getting connected. I tell you what, your emotional needs can get connected even when you bring up the harsh stuff because either your relationship's going to survive through that, you know, all the hard stuff, it'll get stronger when it survives through that or if it doesn't survive, then it really wasn't meant to be because if you can't have a relationship with that kind of honesty, then you may not be able to have a relationship with that person. That's a bold statement. Don't hold me to it 100%. I'm just saying it's a lot easier to have a relationship with someone who tells you the hard stuff, who shares with you the painful stuff, than it is to have a relationship with someone who stays in denial, who never shares anything, and then tries to get their emotional and even physical needs met somewhere else. I would rather be with someone who tells me the harsh truth of what they don't like about me the way I look, the way I smell, the way I talk to them, the way I walk, I don't care what it is. I would rather be 
fully judged in my relationship, get it on the table so we can talk about it instead of having those things held in where the person just feels like I can't talk to you about it. So I'm going to talk to someone else about it and I'm going to get to know them better and have my emotional and possible physical needs met by them. I say, no, bring it to me. <laughs> Let's talk to me about it so that we can talk about this stuff, even if it hurts. And I'm not saying you talk about every single thing that comes up. I mean, if it's not a problem in the relationship, like, oh, you know, my, my girlfriend doesn't like my haircut sometimes. And I like to get my haircut short. I've always liked my haircut short. I never have to style it. <laughs> I just have to comb it back once and it's done. Right now, it's a little longer. Uh, maybe because I spent some time with some musicians. I don't know. Uh, but it's now longer and she she loves it longer. It's not something that she keeps to herself. She comments on it. She will say, I like you better with longer hair. But she says it so that I know what I can do to be more attractive to her. Now, this doesn't always work. I mean, if I had no hair and I couldn't grow hair and she said, I wish you had longer hair, then that's something out of my control. I, I, would, I wouldn't be able to do that unless I got, a, I don't know, hair surgery or something. But if I couldn't grow hair and she kept saying I like men with hair, I would feel pretty awful. It would be nothing I could do about it. But if she couldn't stand to be with someone who didn't have hair and she never said it to me, then she might have a propensity to look at guys with hair and be attracted to them. I'm not saying that's a problem. It only becomes a problem if she sees that as one of those deal breakers in a relationship. And that's what I mean is that you don't have to say every single little thing that comes to your mind. It's just if there's a deal breaker in a relationship, then you need to look within and figure out what is important to you in the relationship so that if it becomes a problem in your current relationship, you talk about it or maybe you have to take a step out of it. The hair example is a little extreme, but you get the idea. Is if there's something that breaks the deal, then don't become betraying. Talk about it. Say, this is what I prefer in a relationship and I am not getting it from this relationship. So at least there's a chance for some sort of resolution. They may not be able to meet your standards. You may have standards that are just too high for a lot of people. Who knows? Or maybe just too high for them. Or maybe it's just a simple request that, and they can't actually meet that request. But the whole point is just, you know, you want to express the hard truths that are those deal breakers so that they don't linger inside of you and you don't hold on to them and build resentment. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. The little stuff, you know, I wish she had a mustache. I wish she had prettier feet. I wish she this. I wish he that. All that little stuff, if they're not deal breakers, probably not necessary to bring it up unless they can actually do something about it. Or you have that type of relationship where things like that aren't taken offensively. That can and does work and can be one of the most open and honest relationships you can have. I mean, this, this subject about honesty and what to be honest about can go into an entire episode on itself. I may have to do that one day. You're like, What is the extent of honesty you should be in a relationship? What, uh, How open and revealing should you be? That That is a topic to definitely address on its own one day, and maybe I will. But let me get back to um, John's email. The reason I mentioned the infidelity first is because let's just say that the infidelity is the big elephant in the room. Let's just say that is the most prevalent, problematic thing in your relationship. The thing is you're both still together, which tells me you probably want to stay together. You probably do want to work this out. So even though infidelity might be that gray cloud hovering above both of you, let's take the next big thing. Let's not talk about the infidelity. You're both together. You both did it. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be healed from. But let's talk about the next issue beyond that because the infidelity thing will find healing if other things in the relationship are also taken care of first. So the infidelity thing I'm hoping will go away on its own if you're able to address the other stuff. Like one of the things that came up for me is that you said you had a special needs child and your wife stays at home and takes care of that child while you're at work. You said that's a lot of work for her. So my question for you is, what can you do to help her through that? This can be one thing you can look at. Like, what is the most stressful thing for her? What if it's taking care of the child? If it is, maybe you can hire a part-time nanny. I mean, these are just practical things. Maybe you can um, come home for lunch and take care of things for a half hour while you're there. I don't know. 
But think about her needs. Like I talked about this in um, my How to Deal with Irrational People ebook, is that when someone's being irrational, I'm not saying your wife is or you, that you are, but in the case of an irrational person, they have a laser focus on something they need. And if you can figure out what they're focused on and what they need and then fulfill that need, it usually it can make them rational again. It can bring them into a more peaceful space. For example, the, the story I used in my book was I was on an airplane once and the woman that sat across from me started freaking out. I mean, probably not the best term to use, but she was like freaking out in the sense of, I got to get off this plane, I got to get off this plane, I got to get off this plane. So we land, thankfully, and everyone is getting up, pulling out their luggage, but now she's like having a claustrophobic reaction. And she's like, I got to get off this plane. And she's about to go into, it sounds like a yelling, screaming fit. And so I told her to look at me. I gave her a mission, you know, look at me, look at my eyes. And I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to calmly and rationally go up the aisle and tap on people's shoulders and say, I have a medical emergency. Can I please get through? And just do that with everyone that's in the aisle. And I said, do you understand? And she said, yes. And that's what she did. <laughs> she tapped on the first shoulder. Excuse me, I have a medical emergency. And they moved. Excuse me, I have a medical emergency. And they moved. And she did it with one person, one person, one person. And she finally got through to the end and got off the plane. What she needed was to get off the plane. So I helped her fulfill that need by giving her a mission. And that mission gave her the re results she wanted. It's kind of an unusual example because she was starting to act hysterically. But anyone who's in a, a position where they are just high stressed can get to that point. But in a high stress position... You look for what they need most and you try to fulfill it. What do they need most? That's why I look at your wife and I go, okay, what does she need most? Maybe all she needs is a one hour break a day. Maybe all you need to do is hire somebody to go there for one hour and do a certain thing for her so she can take time to herself for that one hour instead of that all day, nonstop, taking care of things 100% of the time. I'm not saying you can do that if you have the funds to do that, if there's a friend that can do that, or if that's even the right answer, because I don't know what her needs are, but it would be helpful to you and to her to find out what she needs most. I mean, that's a great question. What do you need most? What would make you happiest? What do you need to happen in order for you to have a better day every day? Her answer might surprise you. Her answer might be, I just want you to make dinner every now and then. You know, it could be something that you could handle. I just want you to come home a little earlier. I just want this. I just want that. You know, whatever you can do is up to you and your situation there. But focus on her need. Because from what you're saying, it sounds like you're in a slightly better space with the infidelity stuff. And uh, you're in a better space, you know, trying to work things out in the relationship. But she's not. So we need to find out what she needs. At least the most prevalent thing that she needs. Because if you fill up one thing could be that filter effect. Once that one thing is taken care of, the rest of it could go a lot easier. Or maybe that one thing takes care of everything and she's no longer mad about this, this, and this, and this. So I want you to consider that. This might be the only uh, suggestion I have for you, is to find out what she needs, fulfill that need if you can, in the best way you can, and try to fulfill the need that is most prevalent so it has a trickle-down effect. That trickle-down effect can affect everything, even some pain and anger from past mistakes. Once the pressing prevalent need is taken care of, you know, the infidelity stuff is probably going to come up again, probably come up for talking. But uh, when you make some room in your head to talk about that stuff with a clearer mind, then you might actually have more productive conversations. That's my goal, is you have the most productive conversations you can have. And then you might have to deal with the big stuff that betrayal, that infidelity, with a less foggy mind, then maybe you'll get somewhere. Maybe you can grow from there. Because if you don't find out what she needs and her needs are never fulfilled and she feels like she's always stressed all the time, she's going to turn into that woman on the plane. You know, She's going to have the same type of reaction where it's going to become overwhelming. It's going to become such high stress, she's going to reach a breaking point. Fortunately, the woman on the plane didn't. She got through and I was able to see her afterward and 
She was so grateful that um, I was there to help her through it. But imagine if I wasn't. Imagine if somebody wasn't there to say, okay, this is what you need to do. And actually give her a resource that she can use that took care of her needs in that moment. Try to take care of your wife's most prevalent needs. And maybe, just maybe, your relationship will start feeling better and getting to a better place. Thank you, John. And thank you for listening to another episode. We'll be right back. I'm going to close the show really quick. Just about at that point where I'm losing my voice. So, got to wrap it up. Be right back. Thank you for listening. Oh, there it goes. My <laughs> voice is crackling out. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. Boy, I got to take it easy. I won't be able to talk at all tomorrow. But I didn't want to leave without saying thank you and goodbye. I want to thank you for tuning in. And I want to thank a few other people too. Like Casper. Go to casper.com forward slash brain and get $50 toward select mattresses. Enjoy the sleep experience that I enjoy on a Casper mattress. Casper.com forward slash brain. Use the promo code brain during checkout. Terms and conditions apply. And I want to tell you about the mean workbook. You know, I mentioned it in the first uh, segment where emotionally abusive relationships and how they start or how they can be formed is often when one person is trying to mold and control the other person. And because that person, uh, the, the, the controller, doesn't want to deal with their own stuff, uh, then what happens is the victim of that control ends up conforming and taking the blame and taking responsibility taking the uh, shame and the guilt and everything that is thrown at them just because their partner doesn't want to deal with it in themselves. And uh, sometimes you can't get through to your partner. If they're like that, they're not going to be able to hear it sometimes. And um, if they don't hear it and they don't want to work on it, then it turns into emotional abuse, unfortunately. So that's what this mean workbook is about. If you go to loveandabuse.com, it's going to give you a 200-point checklist that you can go through and you get a score that evaluates just how much emotional abuse or manipulation that you might be experiencing in your relationship and also what you can do about it and what your options are and um, what next steps you can take. You know, it's not always about leaving the relationship. Sometimes these relationships can be spared. I've had people share their, what I call their mean score, with their partners and they talked about it and they try to work on it and see what the problems are and where they need help and what areas of their relationship. You know, not all emotional abusers know they're emotionally abusing you, but some do. And I want you to be aware of which ones know who's doing it to you and which ones don't. The ones who don't and they discover that they are might be surprised. They might go, I'm doing that to you. Oh my God, I don't want to do that to you. And then they'll start working on themselves. And then you might have others that don't. They go, oh my God, I'm doing that to you? Well, if you just fixed yourself, I wouldn't do that to you. Oh, there's some emotional abuse right there. This, this happens. I get these kind of stories all the time from clients, from people in the uh, Facebook group. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, you can go to Facebook and type in the Overwhelmed Brain Empowerment Group. That's a closed group where you can connect with other like minds that listen to this show and listen to other shows like it and they're on the personal growth and development path just like you and of course if you buy the mean workbook there's a private facebook group especially for those who are in emotionally abusive relationships it's a peer-to-peer -peer support group and um, we got people connecting in there and sharing the, the tough stuff that they're going through so if you're in an emotionally abusive relationship or think you might be go to loveandabuse.com and if you buy the workbook you'll get those resources like the private uh, Facebook group specifically for the mean workbook and also some uh, bonus uh, interviews that I did with uh, people who have survived narcissistic, emotionally abusive, verbally abusive, and manipulative relationships. One of them's an expert on uh, covert narcissism. So very, very insightful, enlightening stuff. If you've not learned about it or you have and you're just not sure what the signs are, this is a great way to find out. Anyway, enough about that. Loveandabuse.com if you're interested. Uh, also, I want to thank the patron members. If you go to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com, there's about 75 episodes and counting that you've never heard. 
They're just, uh, some of them are short, like uh, 10 minutes. Some of them are long, like 40, 50, 60 minutes. Uh, some of them are the interviews that I've done on other shows. And one I just recorded yesterday for people who ask me questions that are more time sensitive and I have to get to them faster. There's a lot that I address in the patron site. So if you're interested in becoming a supporting listener for this show, uh, head over to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and you can learn more about the patron program and how you can support it. Plus, because you're supporting it, I like to give back. I have workbooks and worksheets and also the private episodes. And for those who want uh, even more one-on-one coaching, I do have an e-coaching program in the patron program where we can email back and forth. And that's really helping a lot of folks out there just like yourself. That option's available if you want as well. That's patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. And I almost forgot, I want to thank you patron members who are already supporting the show. I appreciate you. I'm so grateful that you find it in your heart to support this show and that tells me that you appreciate what I put out there. And that means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you, patron members. And thank you to anyone who uh, has donated and used the Amazon button on the website as well. If you go to theoverwhelmedbrain.com, you can use the Amazon button to support the show as well. You know, you can buy anything you want on Amazon. (laughs) It's just when you click on that button, it helps uh, support us by sending us a few pennies to every sale that you make. And finally, thank you to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. And that's it. That's all I got in me. I've got this allergy thing going on because I moved to Georgia. I know I'm blaming Georgia. (laughs) What did I do to cause this, Paul? You're blaming Georgia. But didn't you move to Georgia? Yeah, but I didn't know that Georgia was like all of this pollen and allergies. And Well, now that you do, can't you move? No, because I'm committed to this relationship and now I'm here until her son grows up and we figure out where we're going to move. Oh, so you're blaming her now. No, I'm not blaming her. I just, all right, I'll take responsibility. (laughs) It really is my responsibility. I could get some uh, allergy pills. I can go see an allergist. I can do all kinds of things. Or I could just keep complaining about Georgia, not seeing all the positive aspects of it. (laughs) And the people living in Georgia now go, don't complain about my state. I've lived in a lot of states. I've lived in California, Oregon, Ohio, North Carolina, uh, Florida, Texas, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, um, where else? Georgia now. So I've been like all the coastal states. I've been to a lot of coastal states uh, because, you know, I, I wasn't sure where I fit. I, you know, and plus I follow my heart all the time. I followed a girl to... Uh, California, we moved to Oregon, then she left, and I moved back to New Hampshire to be with my family. I lived in Florida because of a girl. I lived in Texas because we were trying to find a good place to live. All kinds of reasons that we all have for moving around. Never really settled down uh, anywhere because my heart goes back to the East Coast. I just want to be on the East Coast. I'm, I prefer it here. I was born over here. Maybe it's just the weather, maybe it's the change in seasons, maybe it's the humidity, I don't know. I just feel better over here. But Georgia, this has been a tough experience because of the allergies. But everything else is wonderful. The people, the nature, the weather, everything else is wonderful. But these damn allergies. (laughs) There, I had to rant a little bit because I realized that this is all my doing. This is all cause and effect. The culmination of my decisions in life led me to this point, so I must take full responsibility. But, you know, I like to rant every now and then just to get it out of my system because it's like a pressure cooker, isn't it? We think of things that aren't so great in our life and we just rant about them. But if we can always come back and say, you know what, I take responsibility for this, then at least we have some level of control left in our life. I want you to have control in your life, at least what you can control. You can't control other people, so you just control yourself. And when you try to control other people, well, uh, they become my clients. (laughs) Those people that you're trying to control, uh, they end up listening to shows like this. They end up, you know, getting the mean workbook. They end up usually hating you. You know, that's what happens. We try to control people. They end up hating us when we try to control them. And hopefully we get out of that controlling aspect of life and realize, wait, I just need to control what I do in my life no one else. That's what I had to learn. I hope you're already there. I hope you didn't have to learn what I had to learn. But if you had to learn that, or if you're still learning that, keep listening. And especially keep an open mind because that's going to help you step into your power. 
and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want without having to control other people. Just settle into what you can control in you. You are powerful beyond measure and above all. And this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. You are amazing. <laughs>